Hey, the, I'm Suzanne Freitas. I'm here with the IGDA GIST podcast, Game Industry Side Tapes. And today I'm talking with Orly and Julia of our IGDA localization SIG. And I'm so excited to hear what everyone has to say. It's so nice to see you guys. Thank you so much for having Cheers. us. Like, we're really excited to be here. Thank you. I'm so excited, too. So, um, first of all, can you tell us a little bit about yourselves and where you live? Why don't we start with Orly? Yes. So, I'm Orly Perrin. I'm an English to French uh, video game translator from France, obviously. I live in Dijon. and. Um, I've been a freelancer for like seven, eight years or so. And I've recently created even my own game localization studio as well. So new adventures. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, on top of that, I do other stuff. So I teach game localization at university uh, here in Dijon, the University of Burgundy. And I'm the current co-chair with Julia uh, of the IG Dialog SIG since 2020 or something. Wow. Amazing. Yeah. Aurelie's ever busy. Like it's really hard to even like coordinate things because <laughs> <laughs> she's just always no. on fire, but we love to see it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm going to continue if that's okay. Yes. Okay. So um, thank you so much, Aurelie. I'm very happy to co-chair the IGD localization sake with you. Uh, it's been a pleasure for me as well since 2020. My name is uh, Julia Gstatner which is very hard to pronounce internationally. I get it, but <laughs> still my name. I'm based uh, at the moment <laughs> in Austria, uh, which is also uh, the country of my birth. And um, I'm a freelance translator for Japanese and English to German. So two language pairs I'm handling. And I'm not only doing game localization, but also anime, manga, and uh, literature, and some film on the side. And yeah, it's been a pleasure to be here. Um, yeah, to also like talk about what we're doing with the SIG, especially. And yeah, it's just a great honor. It's very humbling that we have the chance to do so much for the localization community. You guys do so much uh, for the localization community. So let's start there. Let's yeah. start with what does the localization SIG do? What is it? <laughs> Where do we well. start? <laughs> Yes. Where do we start? Uh, we do very many, many things. So also the SIG exists for like almost 15 years or something. Yeah. And there have been a lot of stuff going on. And most recently when we took over, we created um, a Discord platform to try to gather everyone because we are all scattered everywhere. We are all freelancers mostly, plus yeah. people working in-house at yeah, different roles. So we try to gather this community on Discord and we try to have a few events. The most active ones we do, it's having YouTube AMA, where we try to interview people on very specific topic about game localization so that everyone can know what is game localization. Yeah. And um, yeah, and we try to animate the community and uh, share best practices, getting involved in many things that can improve the working conditions. Right. Yeah, it's been so great because uh, we've been approached or actually not been approached. Like uh, the committee was up for election. And um, I think in my case, it was like uh, the year where I also had applied for the IGDA Foundation. I know it's a separate entity now, but I was still involved like in IGDA things, so to speak. And I was chosen as one of the um, IGDA scholars uh, from the foundation. And that gave me a really special opportunity to get in touch with like more things IGDA, I guess. And when I saw that the election was up, I was like, you know, it just sounds really great. And, you know, I'm just going to contact people because I already um, knew Simon, who was basically uh, the committee before us and who was looking for people to basically take their place uh, to keep things going with the SIG. And yeah, I was really excited uh, to get involved. And we started with actually four people and then only Aurelie and me kind of like were left <laughs> on the ship. <laughs> and uh, it's been pretty difficult because the pandemic hit in 2020, you know, and 
it was hard to like get in touch with the community and other people because you could network at events beforehand, of course, but then during the pandemic and when the lockdowns really hit the world, it was really hard to like also gather people together Mm -hmm. also for meetups and everything. And I think we seized the opportunity and, um, you know, we're able to create like more online community because of that, because people were actively looking for also like networking opportunities and, yeah, it was just a great chance for us to, I don't know, develop more online events and everything, right? And yeah, I didn't know orally before that, but <laughs> <Yeah>. of course, <laughs> we got to know each other pretty well throughout this whole journey. And um, mm-hmm. it's been a joy. It's sometimes very difficult because it's a lot of volunteer work also mm-hmm. on our side. So of course, we're very, very busy in our like professional life already. And then, you know, on top of things <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to keep things going sometimes um we were recently joined by Sharam who is uh, our coordinator now and who helped us uh really intensely with the discord mm. setup and everything and I think discord it was something that didn't exist before in the Loxic. like there was a LinkedIn group and there was a Facebook group um and there were like uh, special meetups happening by our community members that were done um at GDC sometimes, like there's the localization roundtable, of course, hosted every year at GDC, uh, which is usually moderated by uh, localization state members. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, at Gamescom, there's some meetups, but there wasn't really like an online community where a lot of things happened. And I think we made it possible that this like changed. And that's yeah. really exciting. <laughs> that so, is. And the, li- yeah. and the Discord has gotten even bigger now that you yeah. opened yes. it up yes <laughs> right it's like you want to touch on that oh, yeah yeah it's for like 400 more people that joined the the, wow. the server since yeah. we because first we we did invita- invitations only mm-hmm. so we tried to look for freelancers and everyone we knew in the industry working in game localization and we invited them mm-hmm. and we opened like beginning of the month I think or something yeah and like a month ago basically uh, not even yeah and so the, yeah yeah numbers have doubled and <laughs> I don't know soon tripling uh, I think mm-hmm, there's a lot of members in common so exciting and it you is. guys so tell me a little bit about what game localization is it's more than just translation right yes <laughs> And so, so tell me a little bit about what, um, what that looks like. Do you want to touch upon it or really? Where do we start? Because <laughs> like you said, it's more like than translation. It's mm. at the core, it's like you take a language and you take the message and you try to convey it in your own language. So for me, French and German for Julia, and you try to, to really take the exact message, but in the words of your language. So sometimes it's not the same right. grammar and everything. And on top of that, it, it wasn't already difficult. You have to deal with all the creativity, the puns, the jokes, and something that is spice it up. It's like the cultural elements, something that exists in one culture that doesn't exist elsewhere. So you mm-hmm. have to, to think about how you convey that. So that's it's the same experience for the gamers, no matter the language. And at the right. same time, it's super creative and fun for them to enjoy in your own language. Right. I think it's the like short version. <laughs> yeah, That's the essence of the localization. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it's kind of hard to explain. Also, like uh, we see that localization is extremely underrepresented in the game mm. development community, and um, it's like it was so important for us to also like just spread awareness about that you know, localization exists and it's not something uh, to be overlooked because it creates like game localization. If you translate your game in other languages and basically open the gates to other markets in the world, it brings a lot of revenue in too. It's not just something that, you know, maybe should happen at the end of a game development cycle or something. It's something that, you know, people should think up about beforehand, like even when they start a project, because even when, you know, writers already start writing a script for a game, like, which is, you know, creative content, the narrative, like story, but even like many things. And, you know, UI, UX designers uh, should like think about localization, even like at the start of a project thinking, 
are our boxes scalable? You know, what if the oh. text in other languages is like longer and wouldn't fit in these boxes? Like we had a lot of problems in the past in the localization like industry because this was like a complete afterthought, <laughs> right? Mm. <laughs> and our, I don't know, basically the people before us, like the, the localization professionals uh, in the generations before us had to deal with a lot of stuff uh, where they had to like, you know, even count the, the pixels that every single uh. letter had in the box so that every text would fit. And then you had to convey the same amount of information, ideally very shortened, you know. German, for example, has um, a long history of being extremely long and <laughs> wordy. <laughs> Um, so it's always important that uh, developers think about it uh, when you already like, you know, create the game, like right. even, like everything around it, really, like not just the story, but also like in cinematics or, you know, times change, uh, games change, uh, but also like localization uh, practices do change uh, over time. And uh, we see a lot of like um, bigger companies, I guess, like AAA industries that implemented localization now as a you know, extra departments that are deeply intertwined already in the development cycle, where, you know, developers constantly consult uh, with localization professionals and like oh, wow. ask about, you know, how do we do this? So it makes sense later for people to translate this, or how can we basically improve uh, the localization process down the line? And we did a lot of like live streams about this too, with like experts. And we talked about localization kits, for example, which is something I guess some people still don't know about or like they don't know what it is, uh, which is fine because we're here to educate. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's basically like a kit that developers can already provide for a localization happening uh, maybe at the end of like the development cycle where they implement um, really important information for localization professionals like the gender of the characters. Or, oh. you know, extra important info on the narrative that only the writers would know. Or, like, what if there were, like, small references in the text that the writer was 100% sure everybody in the world would get? But still for other regions, like, you know, <laughs> it's pretty obscure and they don't know really what to do with it unless it's explained to them. And then, you know, the more information, like, we thrive on context, the more context we have, the better the localization is. And this is true for every single project, small, big, uh, in between. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Because right. most of the time we work only with text. So what we see of the game is like an Excel sheet mm -hmm. and that's it. Oh. So, and it's still, it's sad because it's still true for a lot of people in the industry, translators, especially that sometimes they even never see the game. Right. until it's released so they don't know what it looks like they don't have the context something silly is like dialogues it's vital mm -hmm. for languages like french german or japanese korean yeah. to know who is talking to whom uh, what is the right. gender what is the age because you have right. some degree of formality or something and yeah. this is vital in dialogues to make it sound natural. And sometimes yeah. we don't have this information so like julia <laughs> said we need to know that about characters it's yep. super important info and uh, mm -hmm. yeah, it's it's funny because yeah, it's just text we are dealing with, but in the end we need to see the whole product because mm -hmm. we are doing the translations for the players. So they need to leave the same experience as the original version. That's right. the core point of localization is like always think about the players and the game immersion for them right. for right. the best experience. Exactly. Right. It's about the experience. It's about emotion. Like it's not just dry text you want to translate. It's creative work. And we need to yeah. use every ounce of like knowledge we have about translation theory and also like cultural knowledge we have in our region to, you know, make things sound natural and authentic. And then, you know, also, you know, evoke the right emotions in the players. That's really interesting. I um I didn't realize that they didn't they don't send you art panels or anything depends sometimes depends. yes <laughs> yeah wow. when we are lucky and we get the full lock kit that julia mentioned so it's mm -hmm. a game build it's screenshots it's yeah. all game design document that you are free to share we sign ndas so we 
technically, we are not allowed to display anything. We sign the same NDAs as anyone working on a game. Right. So, and we are very involved in those games because we spend hours working on this. And the game's success is our success as well. So we are very committed to make it perfect. So yeah, it's really important to have all this kind of information. And that's why we are trying to educate, like Julia said before, with the best practices and the lives ML we do to mm-hmm. make things easier to understand because localization, it's really in between one culture and another and different others because sometimes you go to 10, 15 languages. So it's very different and very unique in a way. Wow. So you're working on a game and there's 10 or 15 other people translating the same game. Yeah. Right. That's, sort of, that's sort of fascinating, right? That you're all, and you're all working with the same limited amount of information. So. Yes. And we're trying to help each other doing that. <laughs> When we can communicate with each other, that's another story for another time. But ideally, if we can all talk to each other, it's like working with 15 brains for different languages and you can share information. And if you spot a cultural reference that was forgotten, someone can say, hey, I found this. It's a reference to this. And everyone Ah. is like, thank you. Yeah. (laughs) It helps a lot. (laughs) It does. It does. Yeah. What um, what do you say like how do people get involved in localization is it because it's so much more than just being familiar with a second or third language it's so much more detailed than that so how do people kind of start out in localization (laughs) i guess our stories help too do you want to start or really i have a lot of things to say about this uh, yeah, I, I will try to do a shorter version, but yes. uh, it depends because it's a very new field in a way. I did an interview in French with another colleague that started in the early days of localization. It's 1998, so it's not uh, that long compared to the video game history. Like really localization taken as localization as it is like important to translate a game to make it accessible into other languages. And um, most of the time, we, if you ask freelancers now, they all come from uh, translation studies at mm-hmm. universities. Uh, it's been very recent, but uh, I see more and more universities um, having uh, game localization classes. Mine oh, does wow. for like seven or eight years or something. And some are just starting out. So because it's very specific and you need skills like you said in different languages it's more than languages it's also knowing a culture knowing the subtleties and everything and you also need to master actually what we sell as translators is our own language so the mastery of our own language to recreate the same experience in different words and for a different culture so but if you ask older generations they became translators Sometimes out of passion for the games, sometimes because they were working in QA, for example, mm-hmm. or a passion for the language, or it's very different. And now it's getting more professional, if I can say, like in the sense of there are studies, there are classes you can attend to focus on those skills. So that's the basic point. I started, I studied translation, but I wasn't very, very big fan because my classes were not that good. And I did a completely different thing because before circling back to translation and trying to to make it work for myself, looking for blog posts and online courses to to learn the skill actually. Oh mm-hmm. cool. And now you teach localization, right? So <laughs> now you're teaching the thing you wish you would have had. Yeah. Just sort of exactly. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> No, totally. Yeah, or at least you? doing such a great uh, job at teaching so many like students really in person in class, which is so cool. Yeah. I think that's just really admirable. Um, yeah, for me, I think uh, a really important thing uh, for people to uh, remember is it's um, well, it's kind of considered unprofessional to not translate in your mother tongue or native language. Mm-hmm. So um, 
what we are as specialists of our own culture and like language also means that we have to have a really high um, you know, profession in our own mother tongue, which is not something you just have <laughs> usually. Right. Um, you have to cultivate that too and really like, you know, get into the details, which is like typography, grammar, um, and also creative uh, writing. I don't know, some people just have a natural like hang of it, I guess, but some other people like also, you know, like study narrative or like even other structures to understand better how to uh, provide the best you know, sentence structures, for example, or other things. And um, I think it's really important for people to also understand like that a lot of localization professionals, like the localization industry per se is like, I think more than 80% or 90% freelance. Um, There's not a lot of in-house positions in game development companies. So um, a lot of people who want to get into that field um, should maybe just really um, cultivate the skills that you need for actually, you know, doing high quality translations and um, understanding what you're doing. And especially in game localization, there's a few specific things you should know, like because there's still um, specifics like tags in the text that you usually don't encounter if you translate a book, for example. Like if I mm. translate a book, there's no special tags and I don't have to think about, oh, does these do these five articles fit together with the actual variable at the end if they're going to be combined later by the devs, right? <laughs> so there's uh, specifics you need to be aware of. And um, like already said, there's at least, you know, where I came from too, there was no education. So I knew I wanted to be a translator um, since I'm probably 13 or something (laughs) Uh, because of uh, a translation I saw or like a discrepancy between uh, the QA and the actual translation in the game I loved, which was Final Fantasy X. Pretty sure a lot of people know about this. Anyway, I'm not getting into that too much right now, but... um, To me, I knew kind of like what I wanted to do. So uh, the most important thing was to find out how can I be a translator in the country I want to work from Um, if I want to freelance. I actually, to be fair, like kind of knew I wanted to do it. And I always said, oh, if I'm 40, if I'm going to reach this goal, I'm going to be happy in my life. Um, (laughs) But I didn't actually know how to get there. Like I had no idea until I did an exchange year in Tokyo in Japan and met real life translators and they were actually doing translation for a living. And I was like, so amazed. I was like, it's a real thing, (laughs) you know, because where I'm coming from, there's also like uh, demographic barriers. People are, you know, experiencing a lot with a lot of disciplines, but especially a translation too, even though you can do your freelance, you might not know where you can find resources in your country for it. Like there was right. no research for me whatsoever in Austria. I knew nobody doing translation or being self-employed as a translator here. And then finally, I made it my own interest. Basically, I kind of <laughs> pulled my master thesis around localization and video game localization. And through that and through um, doing interviews with specialists and experts, I learned more and more. And then I was like, hmm, you know, like uh, it seems really like, reachable or accessible now uh, to me. But then I think the really critical point in my career was uh, where I went to um, a localization conference in Barcelona uh, that I actually attended for my thesis, like, you know, to just gather information. And I met somebody from Austria who did self-employed game Uh localization. I was like, oh, how did she do it? And, you know, she's now a really (laughs) close friend of mine and I've actually worked on projects with her. And it's like amazing because uh, she told me how to be self-employed in my own country. And then I learned more about it. And since then, I have mentored a lot of my friends and two of them are like really successful in their career now, like in my close circle here in Austria. So it's really like rewarding um, to know that. You know, we can share (laughs) what difficulties we faced when uh, finding basically, I don't know, or an open door. It wasn't really an open door, but we paved the way for a lot of other people. And yeah, that's really rewarding. It's really nice. So there's a lot of skills you can 
basically learn or develop or cultivate yourself and then find out how it works for your local maybe situation. Um, yeah, that's why the community is so important too, you know, uh, mm -hmm. because I know, like I only knew it was possible through meeting other people. And now we create a network of people or like a channel where people can meet of exactly like who face these problems. And they're like, hey, I'm living here. How does this work? Right. So do the studios contact you or are there like um, ads that like they put out mm -hmm. a need on the network or how do you even find the jobs? Interesting question. <laughs> it's very diverse, I yeah. think. Actually, it depends. Um, it's getting harder to work directly with studios because they prefer to have their publisher handling it. But you can reach out to them and present yourself, offer your services. And I think for beginners, the, the easiest way is contacting a localization agencies. So it's agencies, translation agencies, specialized preferably in video game translation because it's very specific. Mm -hmm. And the files we have to deal with and everything are very different from a PDF or something. So it's the easiest way because these agencies can offer services into multiple languages. So, and they can offer the services for bigger games. So obviously it's a bit easier, but then it's, we'll, we'll not dive into the struggle about the rates and everything everyone <laughs> is facing, but that's a good start. And it's can easy for you as a freelancer to kind of get some regular jobs. And then it's up to you to put yourself out there to connect with people, like Julia said, and mm -hmm. meet developers, talk to them, and expand your network, and then they will contact you directly. Yeah. And they will ask you for reference for other translators, maybe in different languages. Oh, cool. uh, if you can, we see something that is very nice, and we had an interview recently on our YouTube channel about initiatives of people getting together either in from the same language. I know French teams that are composed of only translators into French. French, sorry, or people creating their own teams in different languages and they get in touch with developers and offer them directly their services. And it's very nice, especially with indie developers, because we kind of we get a very good connection with them. We are very involved in the game. There is no a, a string of people that handle different things, like you have your the project manager or something. Sometimes you are the reviewer, so you you have so, the translation to to proofread and everything. Here you are directly, I would say like in the team or something. Oh, so, that's nice. And it's, it's very nice. It's a very nice mood. I do love to work with indie games among all stuff because sometimes, yeah, it's just a bit crazy and everything. So it's a very nice experience, but it's maybe something people, translators are afraid to do, especially at the beginning because you are not very sure about yourself. Like mm -hmm. we said, there are not always studies. So even when you finish your master, you don't feel like you are able to sometimes just jump into the world of being a full freelancer going after your clients. So you can start with agencies and then you branch out and you start to contact developers to work on games that you like. And uh, yeah, you can make a successful career, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's also like uh, important to note that bigger agencies usually obscure who you're working with sometimes. Oh, um, okay. So starting small is not bad, um, especially for beginners. Um, finding smaller agencies where you want to like maybe be a part of or something um, who involve you more in you know what's happening. Uh, you have more access to also like other translators and colleagues and therefore learn a lot more. I think the most I learned in my career, I definitely learned from other localization professionals that I work with in projects. Okay. And um, that's very rewarding too, because you just learn the ropes by doing sometimes. Of course, you don't want to start with zero, but um, I think that's also why, I'm not sure if you mentioned this early, but there's like translation tests Usually, mm -hmm. like, yeah. so if you apply at agencies or translation companies, there's usually a translation test that you have to pass to be um, acquired into a pool of translators. Oh, and so okay. whenever a project for your language pair comes around, they might contact you for that language pair if you're a part of that pool already. So this is basically how you start. Um, you basically level up to pass these tests 
And then you can be part of like multiple agencies. Like you're not a part Uh, of them because you're a freelancer, you're self-employed, you know, and you manage your own things. You are able to work with multiple clients at the same time, but you're part of like those pools in multiple parts in the world, maybe even. And so whenever projects come along, like here or there, um, you might be contacted and then um, you have like always uh, the possibility to say yes or no. Um, there's also people who love to work in special genres rather than others. I have some genres that I am not an expert in. So I always say, sorry, you know, uh, it's better. I'm not going to be contacted for these. Um, but I'm an expert in, you know, mystery narrative, for example. And um, so this is how you can start and also like acquire projects. And the biggest thing is to create a portfolio, like, If you have a strong portfolio, you're able to, you know, basically pitch yourself better. Um, Maybe down the line, you don't have to even pass translation tests anymore. Um, You know, I'm in a point in my career where I often say, you know, please look at my portfolio. Uh, This proves I do a good job so far. Um, And yeah, this is how you basically level up because there's an not a lot of like upward mobility other than having more experience under your belt. And then maybe you're going to be, you know, having a chance to ask for higher rates, <laughs> which is not always possible. It takes a long time for some people. So you said something really interesting there. You said mm-hmm. specialty in different genres, which mm-hmm. I didn't realize was a thing. So, mm-hmm. um, so what are each of your genre specialties? It's It depends. I do pr- work better on narrative games, for example. Mm-hmm. I do like all the, the lore, the background. Um, I'm terrible at shooter games. Don't ask me to do that. I don't know the terminology. <laughs> I don't know anything. Um, a bit same like sports game. I'm not very good. Forget me about baseball. I don't want to do it. I'm sorry, but baseball is really not my cup of tea. Yeah. I can do Formula One motorsports if you want, but forget me for the rest. And that's it. It's a specialty because it's something that you need to know the terminology. I did work on a game where some baseball stuff was involved. And it was a pain because even if I could Horrible. find the proper terms in French, I wasn't really sure how to phrase my sentences so that it right. sounds okay for someone who knows yeah. bas- baseball. Yeah. And just this can break the immersion and feels mm-hmm. like a translation, which is not what you want to achieve. So that's right. why we try, we try to work on games we are good at, games we love. Sometimes you can love a game, but not play it. And um, at the beginning, you cannot choose everything. So you kind of take what you are offered and you see if you like it or not. You can say no the next time and then you can develop something and you will find games that you didn't even know existed. And you're just like, hmm, that's nice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I guess so. I have the same <laughs> kind of experience. Uh, so for me, uh, for example, I learned this about myself, I guess, through projects I did in my life. But I absolutely love comedy. I love to translate puns. I love to translate really bitty dialogues because I think I'm really good at it in German Um, and nobody will ever know when I talk English which is really really sad (laughs) but that's okay because I could live that in my translations Um, and yeah I also like I mentioned before I love mystery narrative for example and um, sometimes even horror and yeah like that feels really rewarding to me because um, I can immerse myself better and so I can create better immersion for the players and I think that's really important. Um, I also decline um, some sports games because they just <laughs> like like are really sad. Um, I, I did a translation test once where parts of um, what was it, Forza Horizon, were part of it, and um, mm. I really failed this <laughs> test. Like that, it was not good. <laughs> I I can find the terms like are really sad, but I can't make it sound okay to people who yeah. are really like you know. Right, I don't know. really love in in the scene, right? I'm not in the scene, so it's hard for me to do that. Um, yeah, it's it's important to know what you're good at, I think, mm. and to know what you're also interested in, because the more interested you are in something, um, the probably 
you know, <laughs> more interested to play as well being your tax leader because they can feel that. Yeah. Um, I'm, yeah, I really believe in that. I sometimes even didn't, you know, sometimes you, you want to like look at the whole project or the whole story before you start. So you can translate all the hints in some something. Uh, but with some projects, I took a really different approach where I also didn't speak spoiler myself basically um so I kind of reacted the same way somebody would react when they saw it for the first time and then I tried to create the same feeling oh that's so cool it's you can do a different approach you know however you work like there's so many different people in the world everybody works differently uh but these are things that you can rework later in the editing process if you made a mistake or something but the feeling stays right so that's really uh important to me for example do you have games that you think are like really well translated, even if they're games you didn't work on? Mm, yes. <laughs> you do. <laughs> I've heard about uh, that game that came out recently, Hi-Fi Rush. I yeah. heard praises from every languages about the localization. So I encourage mm-hmm. people to try it in their own language and maybe tell us what they think. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I heard very good thing. Uh, about this. If anything, there is no award for good localization anywhere except Spain. So oh. just, you know, calling out <laughs> to people, maybe we can make game localization awards. <laughs> that would be great. That's awesome. Yeah, I recently loved um, the God of War Ragnarok localization. Oh. I looked at it in English and German. And while there were some scenes that just worked so much better in English than German, they really um, hit the tone right on so many other um, like character tones. And like, you know, there's a lot of different relationships going on and like, you can really feel that. And the dub is insane. Like they took so much care of it. And of course, you know, translation isn't only translating text. Sometimes you also create voice scripts for dubbing. Um, in, you know, many cases, or the dubbing script might be based on your translation you did beforehand. So it's just, that was really good. <laughs> I really like that. <laughs> I was really amazed. And we have this, I don't know if it's, it's coming with our job. I think, you know, when we see media or consume media for ourselves now, we probably always see all mistakes, you know, sometimes mm-hmm. I'm like, oh my God, there was a double space and like, oh my God, why can't they cut the subtitles in the wrong way or in the right <laughs> way? And this is yeah. just part of our job. So when we can appreciate something or a good localization, it really hits right. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I can imagine I watch all media um, with subtitles. Mm-hmm. So um, even though the subtitles I'm watching in English and the subtitles are in English, you mm-hmm. still get a lot from like, that's that's not quite right. And yes. the sub- <laughs> <laughs> Cause I can hear what they're saying and that isn't what they were talking about. <laughs> It's even worse in other languages than English yeah. or the original language, so to speak, whatever media it is. But Yeah, <sighs> I can mm. imagine. And I know that, like, my um, my kid will watch stuff that's dubbed, like, media that's dubbed in, one, in English, and then they'll watch the subtitle version, and sometimes those are totally different. Mm. And so um, it's really interesting that um, you also, and great that you also work on the dubbing tech. Yeah, it, it totally depends on the project, but it definitely happens. Because yeah. you want that, to, you want it to all be seamless so that the dubbing text is just as enriching and immersive as the the text yeah 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 Yeah. i mean sometimes that's hard because we have different uh limitations uh and Mm. this is where the discrepancy usually stems from or also if they're just different people uh hired for the separate job of doing the voice script or you know subtitles for example um Mm. but subtitles have a really like high constraint of like characters per second um Uh. can't be more than 42 characters in the line you have to break them in a certain way you have to use special you know 
terminology sometimes even that yeah. the client asks you for. And there's a lot of different constraints for different media and different translation techniques. Um, yeah. yeah. That's this is so part of games now too. Cool. Yeah. yeah. And that's why knowing that you want to do games, specializing in games, focusing on games is really key. Because then you're you're really Mm -hmm. involved in that immersion. Yeah, that's true. I do think that uh, that other, like, because I mentioned that I also do other media translation, right? And I think a lot of skills I learned there are transferable to games, Mm -hmm. uh, which is really interesting sometimes how it overlaps. Like the character restriction in manga bubbles, for example, is very similar to uh, doing subtitle scripts. (laughs) Oh, wow. (laughs) Okay. Yeah, it's different. but. Kind That's of the still cool thing. <laughs> That's super yeah. cool. Yeah, you you have various skills. Like you, I'm trying to learn more creative writing, for example, to level up. But it's okay. If, it's good as well if you learn how to develop games, so you understand a bit better the issues developers can have too. So you can yes. even find solutions in your own language. Like something I I hate and like at the same time. It's the, the random generation of weapon names, for example, where oh. you have all those adjectives in the front in yes. English and it yes. doesn't work in other languages. Mm-hmm. And I spend time with Excel columns and everything trying to find the proper French order. It's ugly at the end, so I'm sorry, but <laughs> I found a solution that works all the time. Yeah. <laughs> a better solution would be to create all the names available and not let the computer do it for you. Yeah, it's the safest way. But, but yeah, you have to learn different skills in for localization. It's technical. Uh, like, can you write error messages, for example, that are easy to understand, that are short? Ah. Uh, you need to know the console terminology because it's mm-hmm. important for certification in all languages. You need to know a bit of marketing when you're working on the Steam text or social media, for example. You you need to know how to make it interesting in your own language. You need the creative side and um, yeah, and everything. And if you can transfer skills, like you, Julia said, we have so many character limits. Sometimes you need to be creative. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so it yeah. sounds like such an interesting, fulfilling, but yet intense job. Like so. Yes. <laughs> and Pretty <it's>, much. <laughs> very well put. <laughs> and yeah. exactly. Yeah, it's just awesome. And it's such an intellectual pursuit, right? It's a lot of your intellectual power going to your day to day. And yeah. then you run a localization SIG. And yes, <laughs> a lot of brain acrobatics we're doing. Yeah. <laughs> yes, no, but it's really rewarding, like you said. And we're really excited to also have the chance to bring people together like this Mm. and it's rewarding for us too because we learn new things like I learn so many new things every single day for our community members because they're sharing and you know talking openly and seeing that is really exciting that's so wonderful yeah well thank you both for being here and for sharing your time and your expertise and your knowledge and your stories. I mean, this was just such a great, great talk. So thank you so much. Thank Thank you you. so much. Yeah. (laughs) Thank you for having having us. Yes. Thank you for having us. Thank you for being here. Always happy to share. I think, you know, for every viewer, like if you're interested in joining our SIG or community, just Hit us up anytime. We're very happy to welcome literally everybody at this point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Whoever is interested. And yeah. we're very, very happy to connect. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you, Arlie. Thank you, Julia. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Thank you. Yeah, hope to see you around. <laughs>